is not enough not enough in the sense that you may not recollect everything that needs to be done straight away for that okay. we saw that document yesterday where you rapid can, implementation rapid implementation and you can create a report and you can view this list uh, this one the view documents and the setup list you remember this yeah 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 so in this you have all of them listed one below another got it now once you have gone through this that still is a manual activity that you will do yeah now so far we used to do all this manually in fusion oracle has introduced something to help us in this effort and what is that something they have created something called as an implementation project got it now this is not mandatory this is just to help you create a list of to do tasks sort of okay so how does it work this will present you with a list of tasks and activities which you can add you can subtract you can remove you can assign to team members and you can monitor what is the progress on each of those tasks got it the essential purpose of this is basically to keep track of all the things being done on the project earlier like i told you it was all done manually so you never knew whether an activity was missing or something got missed out inadvertently or not got it here at least uh, why this is not coming Yeah, Oracle also I read has uh, you know packaged requirements already, you know, given to implementing teams and it can be accessed and they're listed from L1 to L5. So L5 is you know more larger large scale requirements based on, you know, perhaps, you know, enterprise business unit and then L1 is the most detailed. So more extensive list of the requirements. is what i looked at okay uh i don't know why this is not opening up let me check another instance do you have access to the opn to the uh, opn yeah partner network yeah because you can access documents there like yeah. how 
after a point of time those documents are no longer relevant you know you grow tired of all those information yeah yeah i understand <laughs> i'm still new to this so yeah, i'm not an expert like you it, it looks yeah. very attractive you know uh, you know it was like in the college days you get any notes you like to accumulate all those notes you know and uh, you see a document you see a diagram oh great i must have that and ultimately you know over a period of time you realize oh it's too much okay is it because it's not related it's not used for application the uh, application no, of you know each of your client will have such unique requirements that you yeah. know you, you will never uh, be able to reuse any of those documents got it got it client will say these are my requirements you need to meet my requirement i don't care which document says what you know so yes. that is a bit of a challenge you know so oracle might say look this is a requirement which is currently not offered client will say i don't care i want a solution to my problem got it so these are some of the challenges that you will keep hitting as you move uh, from implementation to implementation and in most cases you can hardly ever reuse what you have done in another implement project yeah another okay. project so what is important for a functional analyst is just to know the system really well and then be yes. able to Yes. understand it from a yes. business process level to understand customer pain points and, and be able apply. to relate it you know to draw the relation between the client's functional requirements Needs. yeah and the application features got it what are other ways i can you know understand that type of you know knowledge more like coming now so right now i know i have access to the instance as well but what other things could i be doing so i think you know more practice you do on the application uh, better okay. you will get uh, you know to me uh, and be able to relate it
Let me see if it works on this instance. Okay, now here it's working. So here you see, you can create your own project. Let's say something like this. And you can call it, I'm just calling it SP implementation. Project. And whom, which user it is assigned to, you can assign it to specific users. What is the start date and what is the expected finish date? Got it, Ramam? Yes, yes. So next, I get to choose what things I want to include in this list. Okay. So when it presents you with a list, it will show you things like you know, payables, receivables, cash management, general ledger, and then you can choose from each of these modules, which ones you want to include. So for example, I want to include financials and I want to do supplier processing, all the setups, expenses, fixed assets, customer invoice processing, Maybe I don't want revenue intercompany and all this. I don't want this. So I will just say So now these become my setup So how often is this you know, feature referred to during a project? Is it only for an initial phase, like during a planning phase? Yeah, initial phase, that, or that too, a lot of people don't use it at all. Yeah. Actually, people who have grown used to not using this, they will probably never use it. But people who are new, you know, over a period of time, uh, people start using this, then they will gradually get used to it. Okay. So how is the tracking done then? Once you get into design and deployment, is it you're relying on some type of uh, requir requir requirements traceability matrix or BRD or? Uh, that's done offline oh. through a Word document or an Excel document. Okay. You won't get it out of the system. Okay. So project process is, uh, project uh, is measured in like, you know, Gantt, like offline Gantt charts, right? Like yes. maybe online, some on some other system, right? Yes. to track like conversions, integrations Correct. and everything, Correct. percentages, okay. Correct. So like tools like MS Project or Primavera are used. 
Okay. In fact, just before I got into this class, I was doing a class for MS project. So that's how do you know everything? <laughs> you gradually learn, you have to learn all this, right? Yeah. So, you know, over a period of time, you pick up all this. Okay, so now see, we talked about invoices and payments configuration. So I click on this. So I get like payables. I click keep expanding till I reach the lowest tax level. Yeah, I see it. Go to task. So, so that's pretty of, helpful. Yes. Each of these is a task. Yes. If you look at manage invoice tolerances, if I copy this and I say done. You can even assign it to. Yes, someone. I'm coming to that assignment. Before, before that, let me just. Now, if I look at, if I come here, I can do a global search also. I click on this search. That's the task. Okay. Now this will open up a screen. I can either come here, search for it and do it, or I can have a list of items here, like a to-do list. Okay. Okay. Now, what I could do is, like you rightly said, I can assign this task to some other user. So, there's this assign task, and I can identify an user who will do it. Got it. So, let's say there's someone called as Casey Brown. Okay. So I can search for that person. Let's say case. So I get yeah. this Casey Brown here. And I say apply. Save and close. I can put a date or I can put things like, you know, um, what is the current status and stuff like that. So this is the task which is assigned to Casey Brown. Do you see it here? Yeah, yeah. And this is the status, which Got is it. not started. Got it. Now, if let's assume I go in as Casey Brown, And I can update the status to in progress, not completed, execution frozen, or any of them. Let's this say really I good, started right? with yeah. it. I can just update it and leave it as in progress. Yeah, then it shows. Got it. Yeah. So the manager or the you know the module lead or the project lead, he can keep checking and monitor the progress of each of these tasks. Got it. This is also a good way for you to make sure that you don't miss out on any configuration. Okay. Yeah. So you have the full supplier configuration over here. Specify supplier numbering, supplier type lookup, tax organization type lookup, supplier value sets, supplier descriptive flex field, Supplier bank account descriptive flex fee, supplier messages, configure mm. new supplier notification, manage supplier user roles, 
and so on. So I could say, you know, I could, you know, help any basic configurations if needed. Should I go in that direction or no? Yes. I can say, I can say that, right? You're right. Because it's not too hard, I think, doing the basic configurations. Correct. Correct. Based on requirements, right? Yes. So. Based on requirements, you are coming up with a list of activities and you're tracking them one by one, basically. Yeah. So one question I have is, this is a really good tool, right? So why is it that, so how do, do people, uh, you know, monitor all these different tasks on a different, you know, file or different tool? Yeah, what they would probably do is maintain an Excel sheet. Okay. That gets a little bit messy, I feel, right? Yeah. Hey, see, again, this is like, you know, uh, we know a to-do list you know, things to do for every day is very effective. Yeah. How many of us do it? Got it. You know, so that's, it's a matter of one, this feature was not there, like I said before. So people have grown used to, you know, people like us, you know, we are, you know, we have grown used to the wrong way of doing things. Okay. Because there wasn't anything to do. Yes. So now that this is there, people can start using it. You know, people like you, you know, when you are coming in new, you can start using this. And over a period of time, probably you will develop the habit of, you know, using this intuitively. Right. So what tool, is there a specific name of the tool that will be used other than this for, you know, a previous project? Uh, mostly it is the Excel sheet. They have, a, uh, yeah, they have what we used to call as a configuration workbook. Configuration workbook. Okay. Yeah. So configuration workbook is one of usually one of the deliverables where we copy all the setups from the application and put it in an Excel sheet. Okay. For example, all the users that we have configured, all the roles that we have configured, all the security profiles we have configured, all the uh, lookups we have configured, value sets we have configured, values we have done, all of that would be put in separate sheets and combined into one Excel workbook and at the end of the project handed over to the project manager. Got it. It is another matter that nobody keeps it updated. Okay. Although the expectation is that it will be kept updated. Okay. Now, if I were to go to each of this, Let's say I go to this first task, specify supplier numbering. So I click on this, I go to the task. So this is the default supply and numbering, which is there. If you are fine with this, don't do anything. Cancel it. Or sometimes people use this to change the sequence number because they might have already, let's say 20,000 suppliers. After the implementation, they want to start from 20,001. Okay. Then you can go and specify the supply and numbering. And once you have done this, you go to the status. Completed. Yes. Okay. 
any notes you want to update, keep here. You can keep. keep it. My guess is cloud has made it so much easier to do an implementation, right? Yes, it, it has. It so has. how long does it take now? Like an implement, suppose if you want to implement financials along with HCM, right? Is it like less than a year now? Oh, yes. It's, uh, six it's months? Supposed, yeah, supposed to take around five to six months, depending again on the scope. But if it's a very, very large organization and MNC and all that, all of that, then you don't, uh, you know, uh, you should expect longer duration. Got it. But average is that. And again, these are like three, four modules. If you bring in more modules, more countries, more geographies, so scope is going to go up and duration as well. So this is the lookup. You are aware of what is a lookup? Yeah, lookup code, right? Yes. So you can figure out, you know, you're assigning a type to a code, I guess. Yeah. How many types of lookups are there? I don't know. Or um, uh, what should I say? The What are the customization levels for the lookup? Customizations for lookups. I'm not sure. Three levels. OK. Lookup. So are you talking about lookup is similar to, you know, the segment arrangement no, in that you can no, have. No, this is the lookup and the configuration level is this. Okay, User okay. extensible system. User extensible system. So it's not a number, it's, a, it's an actual name, okay. Yeah. So the name itself, is, the code itself is the name, supplier, contractor, subcontractor, okay. Correct. This is called as the lookup type. And against this, you have different lookup codes. Okay. In HCM also, we talked about quick codes or lookups. Yes. So where we had said there are different levels. User, system, and extensible what's the difference between these three levels so it seems to you know increase in scope user system extensible but i'm not sure okay one is system system means oracle has defined it and you can't add any value to it okay. you cannot make changes Cannot make changes for system? Yeah. Okay. So it's pre-configured. Yes. Extensible means Oracle has given you some values to which you can add it. So some values can be changed. Right. You can modify only your values. Okay. You cannot delete them, but you can you can only override the meaning of them. Okay. And user is flexible, right? Very flexible. User means you can do whatever you want with the values. Okay. Okay. So this lookup are like a parent-child table. This okay. is the parent. Yes. And these are the children. Got it. So one parent can have multiple values. Got it. See, suppose, you know, there's different types of uh, contractors. You can create a different, you can create a type. 
and then just list them underneath. So one question I have between user system and extensible, uh, do they have each different types of roles? So user is meant for an actual, you know, user, and then system is more, you know, broad in nature of uh, a lookup or they, you know, what does it mean exactly? Other than the functionality, which you just expressed. System means this is used by the Oracle application for internal processing or for some reports or some, some process which is critical in nature. Okay, okay, okay. So that's why it doesn't allow you to mess with it. So system is system, got it. So that's what it, it directly means system, okay. Right. Okay. What is the nature of extensible lookups then? Nature is like, you know, where they have given you certain things which are there in almost every organization. For example, one example is termination reason. Why, why is an employee leaving? Okay. Okay. So now, common. That is something that is tracked in almost all organizations. Got it. But the reasons may be different. So, Oracle has given you certain reasons and you can add on top of that. Okay. So this is just supplier, right? So I'm sure there may be different lookups. type of supplier. Yeah. So all organizations may not have this distinction between the different suppliers. Yes. So that is why we are defining it as user and you can disable, enable, like, you know, if I click here, I can disable it. Got it. These lookup codes are useful because suppose if uh, a manager is making uh, a purchase order, right? They can search up, they can narrow the suppliers based on the code, right? Yeah, that is one. Then categorization of the supplier. Yeah. What type of supplier? Okay. So it's like an internal tool for categorizing and classifying. Correct. Correct. So if you look at the nature, they can be of different types, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, if you go to the right for these lookup, you will find a column called as tag. This tag. Okay. What the tag indicates is basically to which country this value applies to. So, country you're saying. suppose you want to indicate this is applicable only for US, you would put it like this. Okay. You don't, you want this value to appear everywhere except US. Okay, okay. And you can segregate this into multiple countries as well by separating it with a comma. Cool. Not a great way to organize the Dawn system, I would say. Actually, uh, they haven't found a better way of doing it. Let me put it this way. Okay. Because what has happened is most MNCs, they have 
operations in almost all countries. Yeah. So then you need a countrywide lookup. Which okay. can be messier because not all companies will have operations in all countries. Right? Yeah. Now, uh, any qu any further questions on this? Uh, yeah, one quick question. So, I, since I'm seeing it rest, uh, so you know, I read that you know the architecture has changed from SOAP to REST. So, can I kind of know some? Can you shed some light on that? You were talking about it earlier, right? I remember in the first session you talked about how it used to be soap and then we're now at rest. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we go to Google, just do a Google for difference between soap and rest. Okay. Simple object. Look at this first one. Okay. 
So there are multiple differences between soap and red. Okay. Essentially, soap is, I think, slightly older than rest. Rest is much more comprehensive. than soap because soap can only use XML data, whereas REST can use multiple forms of data like HTML, XML, JSON. These are different types of files, including text, text files. It's uh, what, I, what I'm reading is SOAP seems to have more strict protocol and standards. And it's slower than REST. REST and main advantages is a modern version. It's on HTTP, right? Versus yeah. XML. So, got it. So, it can use it not only HTML. Uh, XML, JSON, TXT, all are supported. Okay, okay. Okay, at least this gives me something to work with. Is there any technical knowledge I can grasp from the eyes of a functional? From where? Is there any technical knowledge that I can grasp, you know, before my interview, you know, from the eyes of a functional? Like more, you know, maybe capabilities of OTBI, right? So right now I know it's, you know, it helps for reporting, customizing reporting and formatting, right? right. So is there any other more, you know, information I can grasp about, you know, more technical things that are... Another aspect is data migration. Data migrations, okay. Now that also is something between uh, between uh, Functional and technical people. Functional okay. people have an important role to play in getting the data. Okay. Technical people have a role to put that data into the system. Okay, loading it, okay. Loading so how do, how do functional people get the data? They would Suppose... get it from the customer. Got it, okay. So they would provide a template to the customer saying these are the different things that will be needed to migrate the different data. Got it. So usually in these, we go entity by entity. For example, suppliers, invoices, got it, got customer. It. Got it. Okay. So these are all entities for which we will be doing data migration.
Generally, the customer gives mock data, right, during a development phase? Yeah. Okay. So that too will have some type of data migration process. Yeah, that is more to test out the programs and how the data looks and how the data feels. Okay. Will there be like some type of official, you know, internal testing process between oh. unit systems integrations? Oh. Usually we have three types of testing. One is unit testing. Another is integration testing. And third is the user acceptance testing. Yeah. The user acceptance testing is the final level of testing done yeah. by the users before the system goes live. Right. What is the methodology for doing unit testing? So UAT is, you know, pretty, you know, you create an entire test plan and test scripts, but for unit testing, will you already, be, will you begin to create some type of test plan and test scripts for that? Or at least a plan maybe? Yeah, actually unit testing is for individual objects or individual transactions. Yeah. So the same test scripts may not always work. Yeah, okay. May not, or it might. If it works, fine. You might have something from a previous project which you want to use. Hmm. UAT is more designed, tailored for testing for users, right? So correct, correct. Unit correct. testing is you're testing out the actual product. Correct, correct. Okay. Can, uh, is there like an example of how I can say I, I conducted, see, I know, uh, see, we, we, for our team, we didn't have like a proper internal testing, to be honest. We yeah. directly moved into UAT, so. Is there something I can say that that I could have done as a functional analyst to be, you know, to do unit testing and integrations testing? You can, uh, you know, say that I had identified a list of scenarios and I tested out those scenarios. For example. Yesterday, when we tried out that invoice, applying the prepayment, then right. paying the invoice, those are unit testing. Yes. When you then have that transferred over to GL, that becomes yeah. like an integration test. Got it, got it, okay. If you do PO and invoice, that again is an integration test. Yeah. So you can always mention that as part of the functional testing, we drew up a list of scenarios. We didn't have a detailed step-by-step uh, -step, um, test script because that's more for the users who are not so familiar with the application, who need a step-by-step -step guidance. Yes, and scenarios as well, you know, that's relatable for them. Correct. Instead, okay. we listed down a list of scenarios like, you know, uh, create an invoice, create a prepayment, apply the prepayment to the invoice, pay the prepayment, transfer the prepayment to GL, apply the uh, prepayment to an invoice, transfer it to GL. So these are like, you know, listing, you're not detailing the steps because you know the uh, navigation you know how they are to be entered okay so that's more from a application integrate unit testing will there be any you know regression testing also there could be some internal regression testing well it's pr probably observed Right, if there's yeah. any issues. 
yes so uh, in the, uh, regression testing is more applicable when you do things in volume you know one by one everything might work out got okay so uh, if you look at payments manager paying an invoice one at a time is fine but are you able to pay 1000 invoices together right or 100 invoices together so those kind of things might throw up issues got it. okay uh That's good. Uh, see, those are my primary questions. So I don't have anything other than that. Uh, do you have any suggestions what I could, other than, you know, going on the system today, right? Spending more time on it. Is there uh, any specific things to explore? Specific things, you can look at these, uh, you know, the setup items, you know. Yeah, the implementation that. project. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, uh, are you familiar with how a supplier is created? Uh, I think so. I think I looked into it. It's like a, there's like a configuration where you can go through an what, entire. What are the things that you need for a supplier? So a few things that you can set up, you know, other than basic details is you can also set up payment options, right? And, uh, you will definitely need some type of ID. And what is uh, the most important thing for a supplier? I don't know. Supplier sites. Supplier sites? Yeah. Okay. So, for example, if I go to payables, I go to invoices. I want Suppliers. to see. location you're talking about. Okay. I click region. on create invoice. So I have my business unit here. Let's say I say US one. Then I go to supplier. Along with the supplier, the supplier site is mandatory here. Okay. Without a supplier site, you cannot create an invoice. Okay. What is a supplier site? Supplier site is a address of the supplier. Okay. There can be different purposes for the site, like a bill to, ship to, remit to, RFQ. All these are indicated when you define the supplier. Okay. So one supplier could have a different sites, right? So. Correct. Maybe I'm guessing, uh, suppose this company could have four different sites across the oh, US. Absolutely. absolutely. So that's it's very common to have multiple sites. Sure. So basically, sites can be factories, different factories across the country. So from where is it being shipped? Different invoice, uh, different um, Usually bill to site is one where you would send the payment. Nowadays payments are being transferred to the bank. So slowly that bill to importance of the bill to uh, site will disappear. Okay. So when you go under procurement, you will see the suppliers here. Okay. And uh, if you scroll down, that 
manage suppliers. You can register them as well. Yeah. And um, so there's some form that is sent out, right? From the yes. system when you register a supplier. Also, there will be some type of uh, data migration of item catalog, perhaps, right? Yeah, that's in the item master, we call it. Master. How are the pictures, you know, migrated? So there are programs to migrate the pictures. So you can load up the pictures by scanning them or creating the um, you know, different um, images, storing them in one place and then getting it. Okay. So like here, I get the American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T. All these are customer related information. Okay. This is the address. Okay. And these are the sites. Okay, okay. Okay. Now sites are visible only if you have access. And there would be a procurement business unit to which it will get linked. Okay, okay. So this is where the other day we were talking about reference data set okay. that comes in. Reference data set is linked to the business unit. If I don't have access to that reference data set, I will not be seeing that business unit. Okay, okay. So it's, it's connecting the business unit to the supplier site. So in a way that helps default any yes. information default, in fields. And then you can choose in which procure which procurement business unit can put orders to those sites, can place orders with those sites. Okay. So let me do something. Let me sign out of this and log in as another user. This is that, right? This is the site. I and see. This is the purpose of the site. And as you can see, it is linked to the US1 business unit. So okay. that's why when you log in and you choose the in the invoice screen, you choose the business entity, business unit, based on the business unit, the supplier and the supplier site will default. Okay. Why does it have to be connected to a business unit? Why not just, you know, make it on its own like a supplier site? No. Yeah, this is 
more like a security. Let's say you have an Amazon. Amazon yeah. operates in every country. Yes. Okay. I am a customer of Amazon and I place an order from, let's say, Netherlands. Okay. Is that valid? Will they fulfill it? No, because it must come through, you know, their own, you know, so if, pipeline. If they have an India business unit, they will say you should go in order to the from the India business unit. Got it. Right? I makes sense. Being yeah. in India, I cannot order from Amazon US, although they do allow, they do shipping and all that, but you know, that can work out to be costlier. Okay. So that's why what they do is they segregate it by country or by business unit so that I being in India, I will see Amazon India. You being in US, you will see Amazon USA. Okay. So you will order from Amazon USA. I will order from Amazon India. I will okay. not see Amazon USA. You will not see Amazon India. So there is no confusion. Yes, yes. That's the reason. Okay. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. Uh, so I know, you know, when I was working with the, during my implementation, we were doing a data integration between and another system known as ADP that our client was using for yeah. payroll entries. Payroll, yeah. Yeah, and moving that into our system. What is like the process of doing such a thing? Like how does that, so what exactly is this data integration process? Is it that we request, you know, the Oracle system, we sent out, we send out like a format to ADP and then they convert it? Or is it like a mutual conversion? Like, I'm kind of confused on that. Okay. So basically what happens is we create uh, the reason why that is done is outsourcing of payroll is one of the most common business processes. Yeah. That is outsourced. Why? Because companies don't want to retain the hassle of generating the payroll each month or each every two weeks or every week, whatever the case is. Okay. Instead, what they do is every month, they will send out the data, HR data of who are their employees, who are the employees who have joined that month, who are the employees who have left that month, what are the changes to the employee data during the month? Okay. So changes could be like somebody's salary has changed. So there all the dependent perks, they change. For example, um, me medical insurance, vision insurance, dental insurance, all the premiums might change because of the yeah. salary. Yeah. Social security will undergo changes. So that has a precipitating effect. So when somebody's salary changes, you need to send that to ADP to say, hey, he was getting $100. Now he's going to get $150. Okay. Or then ADP will get that information, pull it into their system and process $150 for the employee. Okay. Got it? So payroll information doesn't come from ADP into the Oracle it's system. It's usually the other way around. We send the HR, all the element data, all the salary data to ADP. ADP will process it. When we say process, we mean you know, how many days the person worked, 
what are his deductions what are his contributions garnishments and you know child support or alimony and all these are calculated by adp they generate the pay slip they will also give you the net amount to the company mm, so for accounting okay yeah for accounting and bank transfer because the funds have to be transferred by the company adp can't do that and they will also generate the journal for the payroll and send it back to you and then you may import that journal you can import the bank information or you pick up the bank file send it to the bank got it that's how so so let me understand this so we so suppose we send the uh, all our, all of our you know employee payroll information basic information adp processes it and then in return they give us you know payroll uh, payroll information yeah, pay, the payment slips data process. the process data okay in and do they cases, send that data yeah in some cases or uh, adp will print out the pay slips as well and mail it okay so is this data manually it cannot be manually uploaded oh, yeah. right so they must send it in a yeah. format that can they, be yeah, they loaded it, quickly yeah they send it through these flat files the text files xml files json okay. files so these are system to system interaction systems to system interactions like even from the hr side when this hr file is getting generated you can place that file in the server which could be a secured location because it has confidential information then the program or the integrator from the adp side comes in it's a program basically it will connect to your server pick up that file and close the connection got it then they process that data do all this and maybe after two or three days connect back to the server and put the process file in that server isn't i think it's called ssl handshake right yeah these are called as handshakes yeah okay that's pretty cool actually to learn that <laughs> yeah i feel like the more you learn it just seems more interesting oh But yes like... yes that keeps the adrenaline flowing Yeah, there's more interest then. Yeah. Cool. Okay. XML. I'm just writing down some notes. Yeah, yeah. System to Go system. Ahead. Who will it? So based on each partner's needs, you know, we send a format, right? Yes. so suppose the oracle system people will send you know payroll information in a format that uh, adp can accept right so that adp will would not have to you know do like a cleansing of formats on their own right yeah my yeah That's and then adp right. will do the same in return yes Okay. Let me think. Is there anything else? Uh... So same way, you could have these integrations for supplier, for invoices, for uh, you know journals. So these could be coming from different sources as well. Got it. So there must be a lot of these going on. How many generally would go on? Uh, I have seen implementations with thirty plus integrations. Okay. So lots of meetings. Yeah. It's Supplies. all fun. All fun. so there would be integrations between supplier payroll what else could be there invoices invoices items. 
purchase orders. Purchase orders. But okay, where would the purchase orders come from? Who would you be in, integrating purchase orders with? Oh, uh, what happens is some companies they have a they might have a customized system where they do their pay requisition processing. They generate the PO. Once the PO is generated, they send the information over to Fusion. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. So it's not that it, it's not that uh, an enterprise will necessarily just rely on the the Oracle Cloud Platform. They'll have different systems that, but ERP is like the the main base where they try to connect all the dots to. It. That that is often called as the best of breed implementation. Best of breed. Breed. Okay. So Let's that means that. you take the best product from different software. Got it. So you could have a payroll, uh, you know, on a different system. You could have a inventory being managed on a different system. You could have the GL being managed on a different system. So greenfield operate greenfield implementation basically means you know starting from best practices and then moving towards uh, yeah. desired requirement solution, right? Correct. That's right. And it's the same meaning as vanilla. Both vanilla mean the same thing. Slightly different. Vanilla is like you know. Um, like you go to the Baskin Robbins and you know, you ask, you see so many flavors. Yeah. Now, do you think they make all those flavors? Ice cream? No. What do they, they do? May, they may be getting certain flavors one place, another one, another place, shipping it all the way across. Like the country. Something they like actually have the standard plain ice cream and then they pour the flavors yeah that that yeah that happens probably you know the colors and the flavors yeah 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 when we think about strawberry we think that you know we are eating you know pure strawberry true true it's first oh, still mango. the same ingredients will be there right yeah so probably the vanilla type yeah yeah so that's what it means vanilla here means whatever comes with the system Okay. If you do any customization or integrations and all that, those are like different flavors. Okay. So when we say a vanilla type of implementation, we mean a standard product imp implementation. Got it. Okay. I think those are all the questions I have, Saurabh. Okay. Uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll look into that manage implementation yes. project. Please do that. And I just opened this. If you can see, this is the supplier called Lee Supplies. Okay. They have addresses which belong to different countries. Yes. And if you go to their site, you will find there's one Anyone. for a, each different business unit. You will only see the one to which you have access. Oh. You will not see anything else. Okay. Behind the scene, this particular one may be linked to multiple business units. Got it. This is the procurement business unit. Got it. So these some are the different, are yeah, these are the different purposes of the 
side. Okay. So if they were to touch upon supplier, this is probably one area they would ask you because the normal supplier is more a passe. Everybody knows about it. They might, you know, if they want to dig deeper, they might ask you about supplier side. Yeah, definitely. Now, this is one. The other thing is the site assignments over here, where you have the default distribution information. Okay. So okay, the okay. way it works is for payables, you have a standard accounting information that you define under payable options. So if you don't enter anything at the supplier level, the one at the payables level will default on the invoice. Okay. Which you have a choice of overriding at the invoice level. Yeah. So it's a multiple level information that you enter in the system. Based on your choice, you may override that at different levels. Yeah. So if I go to setup and maintenance, I go to search. This is the defined general payables options. These are the invoice options. These are the default information that you enter. This is at the system level. All right. Okay. Okay. These are the payment options which are related to payments. Yeah. So you can choose where to put distribution based on requirements. Yes. So Usually what we do is we keep some things defaulting at the payables level. And then you also may define something at the supplier level. Yeah. And then at the invoice level, you may override that or you can just live with it, whatever has come in. Yeah. Like maybe suppliers may, a particular supplier may have some extra, Correct. you know, processing fee or something. Yeah. Or sometimes you may want to override it at the invoice level. The default one has come in, but once in a while you may choose to define it. Okay. Okay. All right then, I think. Uh, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right, I'll let you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And good night. Yeah, if you have anything to let me know and we'll meet again tomorrow. Sure. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank All you, right. bye. Bye.